Hello, everyone. Welcome to FutureCast. My name is Isa Krautio, and I will be your host for this episode. We are a Finnish podcast, so we usually do these episodes in Finnish. So to our Finnish audience, hey, Gaigilla, we're doing this one in English. And to anyone who might have seen our videos for the first time now with this interview, uh, we do have some other English language episodes on our channel that you might want to check out after this one if you enjoy it. But in this episode, we have the great pleasure of interviewing historian, lecturer, writer, Honorary Professor at the UCL School of Slavonic and East European Studies, Mark Galliotti, who is one of the most prolific commentators on Russia, especially after the 24th of February 2022. And it's a great pleasure for us to talk to Mark Galliotti, not only because he's Mark Galliotti, but because um, we're Finnish and, and the national security conversation in Finland is big, it almost has a life of its own. It's not completely isolated from the international conversation, not even close, but it's still good to get some international perspective on it, which I hope to get in this interview. And uh, obviously Finland and Russia, Mark, have... Uh, many connections historically, but there's one interesting one that I discovered or read about in your book, The Short History of Russia, that, that I read over Christmas, and that is that the name Russia, you claim, likely comes from the Finnish word for Sweden, Ruotsi. Why is that? Well, we have to realize that in some ways Russia's hist whole history has been shaped by war and invasion. And in particular, uh, we, you know, if we go back to the era of the Vikings, it clearly was the case that Scandinavian warrior, trader, adventurers who saw initially the lands which became Russia simply as an inconvenient territory to have to traverse as quickly as possible on the way to Constantinople. Um, it's, you know, the capital of the Eastern, of the Eastern Roman Empire, you know, a glittering place. But, and, and for whom, in a way, the, the north-south rivers of Russia were the sort of great thoroughfares that they used, but who, after a certain point, thought, hmm, actually, there's, there's territory here, there are assets, there are resources, there's no real central government. I mean, they, they called this territory Gardariki, land of towers. In other words, lots and lots of little individual villages, towns, principalities, and so forth. And you know, really, sort of, we we see the starts of what we could think of Russia precisely with actually Viking invasion. Cities like Kiev, cities like uh, Novgorod, actually, you know, essentially becoming centers of of this new power. And of course, over time and over the years, then there's intermarriage, and you know, you you actually get the emergence of a new sort of unified Russian people, Slavic people, shall we say. But really, if we're talking about actually some kind of sense that this is a territory which could become a country, that actually is an import. It's brought in by conquerors rather than something that came from the Slavic tribes themselves. Hmm. Very interesting. Uh, let's talk about the war a little bit. And since many of my questions regarding current events will eventually circle back to your ideas about how this war originally started, it's maybe a good idea to go through that first of all. So why do you think all of this has happened? Why did Putin invade Ukraine in February 24th? One of the things that the hardest things to obviously get one's head around is the idea that I think Putin himself genuinely believes that he is on the defense that he faces this conspiratorial campaign by the West to marginalize and isolate Russia, to deny it its proper place in the world, and maybe even to break it up. And certainly that, that's the claims of some of the more extreme people in Putin's circle. Now, you know, I absolutely am not subscribing to that point of view, but I think we have to realize that it's not just his rhetoric. I think it's how he genuinely believes it. And really, he feels he has been at war with the West since 2011, 2012, when you had you know, massive protests, the so-called Balotnaya protests in Moscow, which were a genuine upwelling of anger within particularly the sort of more educated middle class in Moscow, St. Petersburg and elsewhere against you know the obvious uh, election rigging, the fact that the presidency just seemed to be some sort of gift that Putin could hand out and then take back. But as far as Putin was concerned, no. I mean, this was actually evidence of foreign hybrid warfare. This was actually all organized by the Americans, the British as well. We, we, we occupy a very <laughs> uh, salient position in their sort of uh, list of enemies. Um, 
And so as far as he's concerned, this was a sign that the West was finally coming for him. And so in some ways, again, in hindsight, really from, from that period, you, the Putin state was going on to war footing. And therefore, inevitably, when the 2013-2014 revolution of dignity happened in Ukraine, rather than, again, seeing this as a natural and organic sort of backlash against a deeply, deeply corrupt leader who had done a, just done a 180-degree turn on closer relations with the European Union, which most Ukrainians wanted. No, of course not. Once again, this was just clear signs that the West was trying to steal Ukraine. Because as far as Putin's concerned, Ukraine does not really exist. Not as a separate country with its own culture, language, culture, and identity. And so as far as he's concerned, it was part of Russia's historical patrimony, part of its kind of rightful sphere of influence. And this was the West trying to steal it. And he clearly wasn't going to sort of let that happen. At first, he takes Crimea, which, you know, is that bit of Ukraine that pretty much every Russian thinks is rightfully Russian, regardless of whether they're a Putin fan or a, you know, an oppositionist. And then through a more kind of complex process, ended up being part of this undeclared war in the Donbass. So you know, really since 2014, Putin has, as far as he's concerned, been trying to prevent the West from stealing Ukraine and wanting to assert his power. Now, you know, he tried indirect pressure through the Donbass and, and, and none of this was working. Ultimately, the Ukrainians clearly did want to move westwards. And so eventually... He tried a massive military buildup, which ironically enough was actually working. And before he invaded, for about a year before, he'd been you know, assembling huge forces along Ukraine's borders. Under the shadow of potential for Russian invasion, in overseas investors were fleeing Ukraine. The Ukraine economy was tanking. Western VIPs were flocking to Moscow, putting Putin in exactly the position he likes, that of centrality, that they are coming to him to want to beg him not to invade Ukraine. And clearly some Western governments were beginning to try and put pressure on Kyiv to make concessions to Moscow. You know, if Putin really had been this great geopolitical mastermind that we're often told, he would have actually let that continue. But he got impatient. Because as far as he's concerned, again, you know, Ukraine is not a real country. The Ukrainians are hardly going to fight for their independence. Why would they? His cronies and yes-men around him were clearly not contradicting his vision of what would happen. He didn't intend to start a war. He thought that this would just be a simple military operation. I mean, it's not just said, it's not just rhetoric that he calls it the special military operation. You know, he thought he could just roll in, mm. take Kiev, arrest, kill or expel Zelensky and the rest of the government, impose a new puppet regime, and then essentially pull out. You know, this was not intended as what happened. This is one of the issues. The last point I'd make on this is that sometimes people say, oh, why did he do such a sort of a risky act? I'm convinced that Putin did not think this was risky. Putin is actually very, very risk averse. He's very conservative, very cautious. But he had convinced himself that this was no risk, that essentially Ukraine was there lying on the floor waiting to be picked up. And all he had to do was bend down and, and, and take it. And no one was willing, even though lots of people within his circle must have known better, no one was willing to say, Vladimir Vladimirovich, it's really not going to work out like this. And so that's why he went in, because he just thought, well, in a way, from his point of view, why shouldn't he? You know, his, his, the chance to basically take back Ukraine, bring it back to where it ought to be, in his view, was there. So just take it. And, you know, the West is going to do nothing. It's going to complain and grumble, and there'll be a, a few more sanctions, but nothing more. The Ukrainians, some of them will, a few of them will fight, but most of them will just shrug and accept the new reality. And this will be the crowning glory for him. He will have been the, the Tsar who, in effect, regathered all the Russian lands. Belarus already near enough a vassal. Now Ukraine taken as well. The three great Slavic nations together, crowning achievement of his presidency. Yeah. One focal point of this larger narrative seems to be the so-called expansion of NATO. You hear this both from Russia and from uh, dissenting voices in the West, all over the world, actually. Is that uh, just mere rhetoric, like political technology, or is it actually a modus operandi for the Russian government? Are they actually afraid of that specifically? I think, yes, the NATO issue is, is more important than some people would, would like to claim. It's not just rhetorical. But I think it's, it's, on, it's on two levels, really. One of them is actually just simply psychological. I mean, 
We can argue whether or not any kind of firm promise was made to the Russians at any point that NATO would not expand eastwards. And some people have said, oh, there was was nothing in writing, there was no paper. No, but it is clear that Gorbachev and then to a degree Yeltsin were led to understand that that was the idea. And therefore, when it did happen, and frankly, as it should, because after all, you know, the country's petitioning, they had very real security concerns, they wanted to be part of this this, uh, uh, security alliance. But when it happened, for people like Putin, it's not just simply about the the, the practical security dimension, it's also about the snub, the blow to, to Russian prestige and credibility. It's more or less that sense of, you know, you promised us something, you went back on that, we have to act or else we look weak. I mean, and it's very, very crude and simplistically primal, but you know, ultimately human beings are fairly crude and simplistically primal. So I think there is a real factor, particularly for people of Putin's generation, that realize that you know, he's, he and the people around him are pretty much all between the ages of 68 and 74. Um, they're all very much homo sovieticus, traumatized by the collapse of the Soviet Union. So you know, these things matter to them. But also, the interesting thing, it is clear that Putin does take NATO seriously. We sometimes argue about how valid the Article 5 guarantee that an attack on one member is an attack on all really should be taken. You know, would, just to use two examples, would the Spanish fight for the Estonians? I really haven't picked up that same, not not concern, but, you know, questioning attitude amongst the Russians. Not least because from the point of view of people like Putin, NATO is really America's Warsaw Pact. Mm. But in fact, the Spaniards wouldn't have a choice. If Washington decides that they're going to fight, then they're going to fight, whatever. But you know, absolutely, Article 5 matters. And this is one of the reasons why the Russians precisely have been so worried, so concerned about NATO expansion, because there was almost that sense that once a country comes into NATO, you can still find all kinds of non-kinetic, non-military ways of messing with them, but the military option is out. Um, and so you know, whether it's in the Balkans or whether it's now in, in terms of Ukraine, you know, there is a sense that once you've allowed it into NATO, you have lost a lot of your opportunities. Hmm. And I think this is why, again, you know, in, in practice, if the Russians had been smart, they would have done nothing because there was no real chance before the invasion of Ukraine joining NATO. There was this promise that Ukraine and Georgia will become members of NATO someday. But what the Russians thought was a firm commitment to, to, to bringing them in was actually an attempt to fob them off, to, to, to basically give a nice answer to Ukraine and Georgia that sort of sounded less than a straightforward rejection, but which was actually a rejection someday. Someday is always just over the political horizon. So yes, there are kind of real issues for the Russians as far as they're concerned. But I said, I think we really ought to appreciate the degree to which this is actually psychological rather than geopolitical. Okay, interesting. So in case it's uh, as you say it is, how does this look in practice in terms of Finland, let's say? We are the new, newest member of NATO since, uh, well, it's been a few months already, and uh, we uh, voted yes, or the, the, the popularity of NATO membership in Finland was overwhelming, which also might be a sort of psychological effect if uh, if the Kremlin looks at the polls and the, and the, and the yeah, the gallops. How does that change the perception of what Finland is as a country in Russia's eyes? I mean, on one level, it clearly is a forceful renunciation of this notion of Finland being a neutral country. But on the other hand, look, the Russians are not morons. Mm. I think for a long time, they had not really regarded Finland as a neutral country. The same was with Sweden. They had essentially regarded them as kind of semi-detached members of NATO in a way, which is one of the reasons why they were actually quite relaxed in the circumstances about the actual decision, having in the past rattled so many sabers and made so many kind of rather inflammatory statements about what could happen. But, you know, when when, when push came to shove, they realized that really this was more than anything else, uh, a formal recognition of a status that already existed, not least because had, God forbid, for whatever reason, the Russians ever invaded Finland, you know, for its own strategic reasons, there's no way that Europe would have just simply sat back and said, oh, that's a shame, but never mind. You know, uh, so, so in some ways, it, it didn't really matter. But I think the key thing is this. Yes, you know, Finland spent a bit of time, you know, it's it, it's time within the confines of, of the Russian Empire. Um, you know, and, and I'm always quite sort of uh, 
both heartened and taken aback when I see the statue of Tsar Liberator Alexander in the middle of Helsinki. Um, yeah. But nonetheless, you might say from the point of view of people like Putin, these kind of primordial Russian nationalists, Finland was never really theirs. It was, it was a territorial possession, but it wasn't actually part of the sort of the Slavic nation. So, you know, again, there isn't that emotional dimension to it. Hmm. Interesting. Is there anything to uh, learn from the accession of the Baltic countries or is it uh, fundamentally different, as you just say? Is this unique compared to the Baltic countries, let's say, who are maybe part, more part of the old, mm. I, don't, I don't want to say heartland, but at least the Soviet empire? Yes, but even the Baltic states, I mean, they were only really incorporated after World War II and mm. always clearly with, with, with reluctance. I think from the point of view of Putin, the Baltic state, again, I don't think there's any sense he'd want to reincorporate them. There, there is no serious desire to take back Estonia and Latvia and Lithuania back into the realms of the, of the Russian state or whatever. But on the other hand, from Putin's point of view, there were always a good neuralgic point. Any time he wanted to get NATO's attention, he could prod at the Baltic states. I don't know, um, nuclear-tipped Iskander missiles being deployed to Kaliningrad, for example, or particularly provocative military exercises alongside Belarus, or you know, these kind of things. And the irony is that it was also in the Baltic states' political interests to talk up the degree to which they actually feel a threat with, from, from Moscow. Because this allowed them to present themselves as the front line of democracy and the struggle against autocracy and helps explain why what are, after all, you know, take Estonia, for all its great virtues, a tiny little country. And yet it has disproportionately louder voice in Brussels and in Washington. And in part, a variety of reasons, but in part it's precisely because they have traded on this dimension of we face this terrible threat, what are you going to do about it? very, very effectively as a political weapon. So I think the the, the the difference is, you might say, that there has been this this strange mutual advantage between both the Baltic states and Putin in talking up the threat there without there really being a serious threat there. Mm. Whereas Finland, Finland's relationship, after all, with, with, with Russia has long been, you know, a much, much more frankly, comfortable one. Mm. You know, even if I think back to the days when, you know, I was still able to travel to Moscow, I remember talking to different uh, law enforcement liaison officers at the various Western embassies. And for many of them, by that point, this was just, you know, a year or so before, there were very few, you know, very little opportunities to really be able to work collaboratively with the Russians. But on the other hand, you know, the Finnish representative, yes, he he was going up there. There were border issues to be resolved. There were cross-border crime investigations. You know, there, there was still a lot of pragmatic relationship going on. So I, I think from, from the Russians' point of view, there is a sense that the the Balts are, and again, I'm just channeling the views of people like Putin, ungrateful. Hmm. They didn't realize actually how all the good things the Soviet Union did for them, and they continue to basically pick fights with Russia for no reason. The Finns, on the other hand, that's a much more pragmatic, laid-back relationship. So, um, you know, so although yes, they will of course meddle, and we've seen this with the, sort of the issues of, of, of you know refugees you know, being sort of pushed across the border and yeah. such like. So, you know, there will continue to be because this is the way that Putin's Russia works, all kinds of attempts to bring pressure to bear and 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 try and accrue some kind of political value, but there isn't quite I think that same sense of genuine resentment against Finland the way that there is against the Balts. Yeah, that's very interesting. There's many things there you brought up that I want to ask you about. Uh, first, a more the general... the danger of giving long answers, yes. <laughs> yes. to fortune. But it actually, it, it's it's encouraging because it means that my questions that I've written down are, aren't completely irrelevant since they're already part of your answers. It's very interesting. But first, a general question. Um, how does um, Russia use liberal democracies, our principles or laws and, and, and freedoms, maybe, against us. You mentioned the border dispute that we just had in mm. Finland. I have specific questions about that too, but like this concept of hybrid warfare, how does it look from, from your perspective? The interesting thing is that you know, we talk about hybrid warfare as some kind of sinister Russian tactic, mm. whereas, I mean, the Russians' own phrase is Gibridnaya Voina, 
I mean, they just simply have translated it because they regard actually it as something that the West has created and deployed. And they look at things like the Arab Spring Risings or the coloured revolutions across the post-Soviet space, and then in due course, the revolution of dignity in Balotnaya. And they see these not as kind of natural and organic, but as you know, something that has been done to bring down regimes through the sinister use of disinformation, political subversion, and such like. So, you know, they very much see them see it as something that's deployed against them. But of course, they are heirs to a long tradition of the use of subversion. You know, it goes back to, well, certainly goes back to actually Soviet, but arguably even Tsarist times. And so what they do is finding themselves in a geopolitical struggle with a Western alliance that on pretty much any index is vastly more powerful than them economically, politically, in terms of soft power, in terms of military power, you name it, the West is stronger. So like any good geopolitical guerrilla, what they want to do is to move the battle space to where they have the advantage, or at the very least, that we have most disadvantage. And they have decided, with some reason, that our weakest point is precisely, as you said, that we are liberal Western democracies a constellation thereof, with all kinds of divisions and disagreements within and between our countries. And that that is our potential weak spot. Because the point is, they're vastly weaker than the West as a coalition. But on the other hand, they're stronger than many Western countries individually. So this is the thing. And I think, you know, we, we, we have seen attempts to, for example, try and influence the results of elections, which in my opinion have essentially failed and sometimes often actually had a backlash. There's no evidence that they actually had any meaningful impact on Trump's election or the Brexit vote or whatever. Much though convenient it would be to be able to blame Moscow for certain results. Instead, what they have realized is that they have the opportunity to capitalize on our internal debates precisely to try and paralyze us. And so this is what we see. And it's, again, it's interesting because this is a year of elections not just in Russia, but also, you know, across the rest of the world. You know, any time there is some kind of strong issue within which, by the natural workings of a liberal democracy, there are strong feelings and people are disagreeing and so forth, these create opportunities for the Russians to essentially stir up trouble. They, they have no magic mind control powers. They can't actually, you know, make people believe things that they don't believe. What they can do is what to use a term that we tend to use in terrorism studies, radicalize. So take someone who has a sort of, you know, a general belief, I don't know, that um, the government is too intrusive or that the media is lying to them or whatever. But, you know, it's a kind of, it's the sort of thing you, you might grumble about down at the pub with your friends, but that's it. But on the other hand, through the skilled use of disinformation, through supporting particularly kind of extreme voices and, and maybe even direct provocations, what they can do is try and take that person that they feel so strongly about it that maybe that they will support some very divisive extremist political movement in the polls or even do something more active, marching, protesting, striking. It may be even in extreme cases, direct action like terrorism. So this is it. They're trying to push someone who has a kind of a general grudge with the system into something more dramatic. And because this is a, frankly, a post-ideological nation, you know, mm -hmm. it's not like the Soviet Union, which at least had to a degree to pay lip service to Marxism, Leninism. Putin's Russia can support everybody. It can, you know, if one looks at America, it supports on the one hand, the sort of extreme elements within the Black Lives Matter movement at the same time as extreme conservatives within the National Rifle Association. If you look at Europe, you know, it can support the extremes of left and right, secessionists who want to break out of existing countries, nationalists who want to maintain them. You know, they don't care what the issue is. They just simply try to magnify the tensions so that precisely they can either rip us apart or paralyze us so that we're not really able to, to mobilize and muster our you know, real strengths. Yes. Uh, one example of this that you brought up earlier was the border dispute we had in Finland. This happened last year. Just a quick overview for those who don't know. Uh, well, Finland is a European country, a liberal democracy. We're bound by and committed to international law when it comes to receiving refugees. Uh, if a refugee comes to our border, seeks for asylum, we take them. And Russia knows this. And by the end of last year, they sent 
uh, or I mean, uh, I think it's quite likely that some authorities over there were uh, coordinating some sort of uh, influx of, of refugees to Finland, which then exactly caused this debate in Finland. Do these freedoms matter? Should we start interpreting these this international law that we're bound by differently? And and it it started to um, I, it wasn't I don't I wouldn't say the Finland radicalized, but there was definitely this dynamic, this tension that was created, and then Finland decided to close the border. And it's very interesting. I I remember this 15 minutes before this interview uh, that I had seen your name in a Swedish newspaper. And I want to facilitate a little uh, a mini debate here because you were, we have a presidential election here in Finland. And uh, the person who's most likely, according to the polls right now, to become president, Alexander Stubb, had an interview in Dagens Nyhet, that in Sweden. And you got mentioned. Um, and I'm translating directly here. So my apologies if this is a bit clunky, but... Um, you said about the border dispute that this is a um, choice between two evils, a loose-loose situation that Finland has with uh, the border with Russia. Uh, the Russia expert Mark Galliotti from Great Britain um, has called the closed Finnish border a propaganda victory for Putin. Um, you see, uh, this is a quote by you, here you see a Western country who says that it's engaged in the battle for a liberal democracy uh, in, UK, in, in Ukraine, but at the same time, it's closing its borders uh, from asylum seekers who need help. This is the quote. And also you may say if you feel like you're being misrepresented here. And then Stubb answers, uh, no, no, uh, it's as we say here in Finland, it's bullshit. This is a balancing act between international law and national security. Finland is steadfast in both. It is Russia that is supporting international crime and undermining human rights. We cannot go with Russia in their own game in this question. We have to keep our head cold. So other than being something that a presidential candidate has to say when he's being given that question, do you think there's any merit to what he said there? And what would you, how would you respond I mean, the honest answer is, and again, this this is a very deeply sort of tedious way of replying, is I don't actually think that I necessarily disagree with him, mm. um, even though it's a lot more exciting to to find oneself being sort of <laughs> presented as, as the opposition to the presidential candidate. No, I mean, the point I was making was precisely that, that the Finns were put in an un, unenviable position. I mean, it wasn't quite the same as when Belarus, you know, actually clearly sort of arrange for plane loads of refugees to be brought in precisely to try and sort of throw them at the Polish border. In this case, it seems rather more than the Russian government, which, you know, has a more than nodding relationship to a variety of organized crime syndicates, simply just made it clear that there will be absolutely no opposition to anyone who wanted to move people to these um, crossing points and then just basically allowed the, the underworld market to, to, to do the heavy lifting there. But the point is, exactly from the Russians' point of view, they, they regarded this as a potential win-win situation. Either Finland would have found itself suddenly besieged by an unexpected and unusually large number of, of, of asylum seekers and refugees, many of whom I'm sure actually had perfectly good cases, others probably who didn't. But the point is, again, it's something that, that would have become politically divisive at home and, you know, cause some problems. And then often these operations are done not because they have a specific expected outcome, but just to see what happens. And well, it might work, it might not work, there's no real loss to Russia. On the other hand, by closing the borders, and thus, you know, as, as a, you know, would, would seem to be in terms of protecting national security and national political kind of consensus, it did provide the Russians with a propaganda talking point. Not so much in the West, but firstly, at home, remember that they are trying to, you know, the, the Kremlin is trying to convince the Russian people that basically it's it's in this war because the West hates Russians. They're constantly trying to talk up the supposed Russophobia of the West. And so this is an example of that. But also actually in the global south, or as the Russians have started taking to calling it the, the global majority. Um, and they're saying, look, you know, we are the anti-colonials. It's actually the West, the selfish West, who basically just want to exploit the world and close themselves off from, from any of the responsibilities thereof. So, you know, I look, it, it, you know, I absolutely appreciate that from the point of view of, you know, 
a government having to make a decision in a, in a tough situation. Mm. You know, there, there, there was no way of satisfying everyone in this. And I'm not actually saying that the decision that they made was wrong. I just think one has to accept that, unfortunately, in this position, it, it, you know, whereas Putin is not a chess player, there clearly are people in the Kremlin who are, they had precisely put Finland in that lose-lose situation. Yeah. Would you say that resilience in terms of liberal democracies when facing these challenges might partly be compromising these values? Yeah. I mean, again, it's it's, it's this very delicate balance constantly because, you know, we, it's a little bit like I remember once uh, going to the retirement party of a British policeman. And this was quite some time ago. Um, and and when a certain amount of, of alcohol had been drunk, he was complaining about the fact that these days, you know, it's so difficult to be a proper policeman. Back in the, back in the good old days, you know, you, you knew someone was a villain, and of course you'd plant some evidence on them to put them away, and that means that a bad person gets off the streets. The problem we have in the moment is precisely that actually we have to observe our own values. Just because the other side does not is not an excuse to do so. Otherwise, we just end up becoming two authoritarianisms that happen to be competing. And we might as well just all relocate to the Russian-Chinese border. No, I mean, I think in, in this circumstance, absolutely, you know, resilience has to be firstly about, yes, all the obvious things, everything from, you know, proper counterterrorism measures to media um, you know, literacy that allows people hopefully to try and spot when they're being fed disinformation. All of these sort of very good things. Um, but it also has to be about recognizing that point. Something that we have with terrorism, you know, I mean, Britain obviously has a particularly sort of you know, long and often difficult relationship with how you deal with terrorism. And it reached the stage where actually Britain had become quite resilient. And part of that is an understanding that you can't stop every operation. That sometimes the terrorists are going to get through. They're going to be bombs. There's going to be killings. And, you know, you don't overreact and you don't let that dishearten you. And I think that's something that we have to add. And, and I think in, in fairness, I think Finland is probably rather further along that than most countries. But that acceptance that, look, yeah, sometimes our values are going to get in the way of actions to support our own interests and our resilience. But the point is, what's, why are we doing all these other things mm. if not to support and protect our values? Yeah. That has to be the the precious treasure around which all these defenses are being placed. And if that means sometimes that yeah, we we are hampered, we have one hand tied behind our back, it's the way it is. Yeah. And then the difficult challenge becomes justifying those principles and 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 I mean arguing for their value, even though when there's no immediate benefit for them, even a disadvantage, as you might say. That's it's a, it's an interesting political challenge. There's something that the Baltic countries and Finland share. Uh, not just the Baltic country, countries in Finland, uh, probably more so the Baltic countries. Uh, it's a significant Russian minority in the population. There's about a hundred thousand Russian Finns, and uh, some some who are my friends even. And um, I am reminded by Putin's rhetoric in 2014 when he said that um, he wanted to protect the Russian minority in eastern Ukraine, and that's part of the reason why whatever happened there happened, and, and Crimea as well. Is that po uh, political rhetoric, political technology, or is that a modus operandi? Is that actually something that Putin cares about and something that Finland should look at, or any country with a significant Russian minority should look at uh, with uh, care? In my view, it's rhetoric. I mean, this is yeah. the interesting thing. that Look, up until the Revolution of Dignity, Putin didn't care about the, the ethnic Russians of the Donbass. He still doesn't care about the ethnic Russians of northern Kazakhstan, not least because Kazakhstan is a sort of ally and, and also, you know, if, if he did anything, then the risk is of bringing China in. And this is something that gets mobilised whenever it's, it's politically useful. Um, I mean, even if one looks today, I mean, actually, a disproportionate number of the soldiers who are fighting and dying in Ukraine are precisely drawn from the Donbass region. And in many cases, their conditions are so much worse than ordinary Russians. You know, we, we have some kind of set piece, you know, they're, they're rebuilding um, Mariupol, for example, and, and such like. But on the whole, it is clear that there is no real care. I mean, this was the tragedy of the Donbass. Actually, neither Kiev nor Moscow really cared about them until it mm. gets to fight over them. 
And the interesting thing is that uh, you know very few of these Russians want Moscow's assistance. I remember talking once to an Estonian capo, which is a security police officer, who said that, look, up until 2014 and the annexation of Crimea, there had been a real problem politically with the Russian speakers of uh, Narva, you know, very much on, on the Russian border. But of course, look, that's natural. This is what you do in a democracy. You find some kind of fault line issue around which you can cohere a constituency, and then you use that to, to, to basically bargain for resources why we're unfairly treated and such like. Um, then annexation of Crimea happens. Suddenly things get very real. And mobilizing your Russian identity, which was politically useful at one point, now runs the risk of, well, actually, does that mean then the Russians will take this seriously? You know, these people can just cross the border into, into, into you know, neighboring Russia. and they, they know the difference in their life. When it comes down to it, do they want to be part of a liberal, economically dynamic European country or not. Well, suddenly what, what, what this Kappa was saying was not only was the you know, political agitation of the Russian speakers, you know, in terms of over politics, suddenly damped down. They had a lot more um, applicants to join the security police from this Russian community because precisely they did not want to become gathered back into the bosom of the motherland. Um, and I think if, if anything... I believe that the West is missing a potential, both something that is morally right, but also right from a Machiavellian point of view, in terms of how we treat the Russian minorities that are across you know, our various countries. You know, actually, a lot of them do face quite a bit of prejudice. A lot of them are more or less being forced to say, well, are you a good Russian or a bad yeah. Russian? Um, in a way that no one else gets given sort of equivalent of loyalty tests and such yeah. like, you know. Or, um, instead, we should be mobilizing these people. We should be using them, you know, actually sort of saying, look, this, this is proof that we are not Russophobes. This is proof that what Putin is saying is wrong and trying to see how we can do that to undermine Putin's narrative at home. Um, but I, I so I, I think that it is not real for Putin to claim that he cares for a moment for Russians outside the country, any more than he cares about Russians inside the country, let's be honest. Otherwise, why would he and his cronies be stealing from it at such a, a rate? But on the other hand, you know, it is something we need to be thinking about because Putin will use it as a weapon. And honestly, we could use them as a weapon against Putin if we chose to. Yeah. there's That reminds me, there's a Russian restaurant just a few blocks away from here that... Uh, experienced significant loss of sales after the war started. And obviously you can't go to any individual and force them to go to a restaurant they don't want to go to, but it's just a tragedy. It's 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 a very unfortunate side effect. And it's kind of a low hanging fruit for liberal democracies to make that distinction that, hey, we can still go to a Russian restaurant and appreciate this place and be against the war. It seems like such a low hanging fruit. Yeah, and look, we, we see this in so many cases of, you know, universities taking Dostoevsky off the syllabus and this, that and the other. On one level, one could say, well, this is this is trivial and this is their choice. But what I think people don't appreciate is the degree to which every time you have some act like that or some politician, however marginal, who makes some inflammatory statement about, well, Russians are bestial creatures and whatever, which we do sometimes hear, mm -hmm. the propaganda game that gives Putin is immense. And look, I still have Russian friends in, in Russia. And, you know, it, 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 sometimes it's harder to talk to them than others. But, you know, those with whom I still communicate, sometimes they come back to me. And look, these are generally speaking from the kind of liberal educated wing, you know. Um, they come back to me and say, what's this I hear? Um, you know, because it's clear that every time something like this happens, it is broadcast through all the state media sort of structures as, again, proof that Putin is right. Proof that, in a way, we don't want this war, but it's forced upon us by those terrible Russophobes in the West. Mm. Yeah. Something that seems apparent, and uh, it's obviously always hard to, hard to interpret Russian uh, rhetoric, but um, as an example, this year, according to, to a Russian news station, uh, there's going to be a court case trying to determine whether or not there there was a genocide committed in Karelia during the continuation war, mm -hmm. um, during a time where there absolutely probably was some dark stuff happening. It was a war. Finland had just uh, taken over part of the land in, in, in what was then, and even now, Russia, 
and taken back some of, of Finnish Karelia. And I, I, I haven't read much about this, so I don't want to say anything confidently, but I think historians have a consensus that something happened and it had something to do with ethnic Russians, mm-hmm. but it don't, probably wasn't a genocide or anything like close to that. Such a big word. Um, but discrimination for sure. But if this historical event gets the label genocide put on it, or even just that this rhetoric is being kept up and brought up, what does this mean in terms of the changing relationship between Finland and Russia? How should we interpret this? I mean, there's a couple of points there. And first of all, I mean, you're absolutely right when you said genocide is a very big word. And I think the problem is that it's also being cast around a lot in the context of Ukraine, where Russia is being accused of trying to commit a genocide against the Ukrainians, which again, I mean, look, it's something that obviously international lawyers will have to to argue over, but I, I don't see that because genocide is a very kind of specific thing. It is a yeah. policy of trying to wipe out an entire people rather than just simply a very ugly, nasty war. In some ways, we've forgotten just how ugly and nasty mass industrial wars are. Mm. Um, and I think one of the reasons why we're getting then and this is not the only case of Russians themselves trying to say, oh, no, we were genocided, is that same reason. It's almost like, well, if you're going to accuse us of something, we're going to accuse you of it. Secondly, I think it's important to note the degree to which we have a tendency to assume that everything comes down from the top in in Russia. And yes, of course, whatever Putin wants, Putin gets, at least in terms of policy, if not outcomes. But actually, we should realize the degree to which this is a system, I've called it an ad hocracy in which you have a lot of individual actors who are trying to do what they think the boss will want. Um, And therefore, they, they, they often generate their own ideas. Now, this particular case, Karelia is an odd case, odd situation, because it's where Nikolai Patrushev, the Secretary of the Security Council, very, very, I mean, a man who is so hawkish that at times he makes Putin look sound almost dovish, um, you know, I've described him as, 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 in my opinion, the most dangerous man in Russia. You know, clearly a very powerful force these days. Um, he was, uh, you know, head of the FSB, the Federal Security Service, well, the security apparatus rather, um, you know, in, in Karelia, still has political and business interests there. And as I understand it, it may well have been that people in Karelia came up with this bright idea pitched it to Patrushev. Patrushev said, that sounds like a wonderful idea. I may be slightly caricaturing how things work, but, you know, essentially gave yeah. it his blessing without actually thinking that this was important enough to send up to, to the top. Um, so I think this is this is an example of the kind of local initiative. Now, of course, that doesn't stop the Kremlin from at some point deciding, ah, this is useful. You know, at some point when we have a dispute with, with Finland, we can bring this up and say, huh, you know, you're trying to t- tell us what's moral you've never addressed your own genocidal past or or whatever. So yes, but the point is, again, it's something that can be mobilized when the Kremlin regards it as necessary. It certainly isn't the kind of thing that will force the Kremlin into anything. So, I mean, I think what this really represents is that pretty much with any of its neighbors and interlocutors, the, the Putin regime in some ways builds up a a treasury of grievances, different reasons why this particular country is bad and specifically is is anti-Russian. And it'll be different from the case of Finns, from, let's say, I don't know, well, Germany still has to deal with Mm. the Great Patriotic War, even though Germany today is just light years away from from that. Um, Britain, I mean, for God's sake, we still get the Crimean War um, and all kinds of other things still thrown at us. So, you know, again, it, it says it's, it's, it's about building up that, that treasury of grievances. So what it says is two things. One is that really for the Putin regime, avenging old slights has in some ways become the central element of, of its policy. It's all about why people are nasty to us and why we have to push back. But secondly, it is also sufficiently um, pragmatic and manipulative that it, it, you know, it looks for excuses to have on hand. And what that means is next time there is a specific and particular dispute with Finland, that's the point when it'll start, it'll pull out, it'll rummage around in its box 
for something shiny to be able to present and say, and this is why the fins are bad, and this is why we have to do something about it. Mm. Yeah. Europe, more largely. have Has Europe more broadly been woken up to the fact that post-war Europe or the spirit of Helsinki, whatever you want to call it, has been broken by the Russian invasion? Or is there still like this limbo lull type of uh, mentality in many countries? How do you see it? I mean, I think this is the difficulty because there's, there's Europe as in, you know, a single conglomeration of nations and there's yeah. Europe, all the various individual nations. And the fact yes. of the matter is the world looks so different from when you're in Rome compared with when you're in Riga. True. And in fact, I mean, I'm half Italian, so, you know, sort of, in conversations with, for example, people from the Italian Ministry of Defence and Foreign Affairs, I often get actually a sense of exasperation. On the one hand, they say, yeah, yeah, of course, we, we, we have to worry about Russia, we have to support Ukraine, but the real security threat to Europe comes from the South. Mm. It comes from North Africa, it comes from the Middle East. Yeah. These days, they would say, probably also comes from the Red Sea. Um, so, you know, obviously one has to acknowledge the degree to which there are huge differences. I think the trouble is, this is one of those areas where I think we do see quite a gap between the rhetoric and the reality. We have all this very strong rhetoric about how, you know, we'll be supporting Ukraine for as long as it takes with whatever it takes, and that there can no return to the status quo and such like. Um, and indeed that there is now a potential security threat. I mean, I don't actually see Russia as being likely to invade NATO countries in any way, but nonetheless... That's something that we're seeing talked up a lot more. And yet, if one looks at actual policy, you know, are people building the kind of military establishments that would be necessary in order to repel a, a putative Russian invasion? Frankly, only the Poles. Um, you know, actually, are, are people really convinced that the world has changed? No, not really. I think there is an awareness that, you know, even when there is some kind of peace in Ukraine, whenever that will, will be, whatever that will be, um, nonetheless, you know, there will still be an antagonistic relationship, at least so long as Putin is in the Kremlin. There, there will be some kind of sanctions, particularly in terms of controls over technology and investment going into Russia and that kind of thing. So I think there is an awareness of that. But the point is that's that's a very sort of low level of the sort of lowest common denominator. Other countries think that it actually you know, our relations will be that much more dangerous and antagonistic than that. We have to prepare for, a, you know, a world in which if you ever let down your guard, some rapacious outsider will try and sort of, you know, attack you or affect your interests. Others think that, in fact, we will be going back to quite quickly a, a much more recognisable kind of, if more bad-tempered, status quo. The point is, we haven't really been able to have an honest discussion about this because that would involve actually having to be honest about what, what our interests in Ukraine are and be honest about the fact that it matters distinctly where you are and which country, that there isn't actually the same degree of unity that we pretend to. Mm. So I think, unfortunately, it's just one of those discussions that aren't being had for short-term pragmatic reasons, and so we all just pretend that we're on the same page. Yeah. Oh, that reminds me, I'm kind of forcing you to give a contemporary political answer now, and if you're how comfortable you're doing that, but uh, something you've said before is that Putin is waiting for Europe uh, to get split on this question, basically. Um, use Europe's political challenges against itself. Just wait, 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 and these problems will emerge and they will mm -hmm. start to inflame enough that focus will be diverted away from Ukraine. Do you think he has a point? Are there genuine short-term and long-term challenges that Europe has to think about if it wants to stay resilient? There are, and un undoubtedly. I mean, look, to a degree, Putin is acting out of his own prejudices about Europe. He can't yeah. understand how you can actually have a, co a coalition of countries which is not about you know one being dominant and the others being satellites and such like. And secondly, he believes that Europe will break apart in, on this, or at least not the whole European Union, but the, the consensus will break, because he has to, because this is really his his only chance for dragging some kind of triumph uh, out of the mess of Ukraine. But beyond that, well, I mean, of, of course, every time we have someone like um, Ursula von der Leyen saying that there is no such thing as Ukraine fatigue, 
I bury my head in my hands because, of course, there is Ukraine fatigue. And we have to yeah. be honest about that if we are to address it. And I think this is one of the reasons why we're now getting all these calls about, well, how the Russians could, within two to three years of the end of the war, invade NATO. It's it's in some ways a, a response, a sort of a rhetorical arms race that are people trying to get, no, 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 this, this is why you have to care about Ukraine, because any minute otherwise the Russians will come and eat your babies. In practice... So much obviously depends on the United States. Mm. And therefore, I think in you know both Putin and the rest of us are to a degree waiting to see who wins the presidential elections and if it is Trump, what he actually chooses to do. Because I think that if the Americans start to genuinely scale down their support for Ukraine, I think it will be an excuse for a lot of European countries to say, well, there's nothing much we can do. You know, rather than thinking, well, we should rise to the challenge. This is, after all, our continent, our immediate security risk, rather than the Americans. We will find whatever it takes, the money, the materiel. No, I think there will be other countries that will say, well, then it's hardly worth us trying anything without the Americans. And it'll be a, a sort of great excuse. So I think there, there is a degree to which there are already, I mean, obviously, we know that there are, you know, Hungary is definitely the, the outlier. There are other countries that, frankly, are less enthused about having to spend, you know, what after all, collectively, we spend billions of euros, dollars and pounds on Ukraine in terms of military and financial assistance every month. You know, how many politicians could not find a use, especially in an election year, for a few few more million, you know, to, to, to be able to spend on some tax cut or whatever? Um, so I think I, I think that we have to acknowledge that it's there. And again, this is this is one of my points of exasperation. It's it's much the same as with, with the earlier question, is that the longer we try to pretend that a problem does not exist, then the less able we are to actually address it. And I think that there isn't a clearly articulated sense of why Ukraine should matter to us. Mm. And there's all kinds of different ways you can answer that. And there are some people who'll say it doesn't really. Well, that's fair enough. Again, within a liberal democracy, there will be a whole variety of debates. But because we're not really having that debate, and because that debate is so often, you know, people try to close it down. Mm. Um, and I, I'm not saying that I'm trying to argue as to why we shouldn't be supporting Ukraine or anything like that. But I'm saying we should have that debate. Because yeah. otherwise, what happens is if you immediately, if, if someone immediately says, should we really be doing this? And someone says, oh, so you want Putin to, to kill, kill the Ukrainian people or whatever. Well, of course, that's not what this person is likely yeah. to be arguing. But because we're not having a debate, we're not addressing this. And therefore, my big concern is that it's very hard to be sure exactly where the tensions lie. Because in some ways, it's being kept out of view. Everyone's sort of going on television and saying the right thing. And then going back to their constituency office or their parliamentary caucus and saying something very different. Could not agree with you more there. Uh, well, let's say someone gives you this argument then. Europe is not in its current political climate able to turn its economy into a war economy big enough to support Ukraine, to replace the US, let's say that they pull away, that this is just not realistic. What would your response be? I mean, the honest answer is it's, that's probably true. If the United States mm. just cuts all aid, um, because it's not just simply a question of money. And this is the unfortunate thing. We have become accustomed to the modern just-in-time economy. You cannot get Amazon Prime delivery on five million artillery rounds. Um, you know, it's 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 not something that it's just a question of well, we have the money. Europe has the money, but absolutely, it doesn't have the productive capacity. And although by the end of this year there will be a lot more productive capacity, particularly in terms of ammunition, available, it still won't be enough to frankly meet the needs and also to allow Europe to arm itself and and, and protect itself. In a, in a world in which there's a variety of threats, you know, who thought that it was going to be Houthis, Houthi rebels firing ballistic missiles was going to be the sort of the key threat at the beginning of 2024. Yeah. You know, this is, there has to be an element in which you know stuff will be happening and you have to have preparations and, and, and forces ready for that. Um, so, yeah, it, it, in that case, it will be be very different. You know, it, it, the, the, a world without American assistance. I mean, as I said, I really should stress, I think it's highly unlikely that even if Donald Trump is elected, that he will just pull the rug out yeah. straight away. I mean, there, there's a lot of hysteria about Trump. But if one looks at the first Trump presidency, for all his rhetoric about how great Putin was and how wonderful a relationship they had, he wasn't going to put any political capital that. It's just that Trump hasn't met an author, sure. authoritarian leader he doesn't love.
Um, but yeah. he loves himself even more. Mm. Um, so, you know, I don't think we're going to be in that nightmare scenario. But if we were, yeah, the realistic answer is absolutely that, that, that Europe would not be able to fill that gap. Um, and, and it'll take years to build the kind of civilian but war-oriented economy which it would you know which would allow europe to have to be in that position to do so and it's maybe it's, it's something that needs to be thinking about for, for, for the long-term planning of, of, of the european defense sector but it's not going to be the answer to, to ukraine's problems yeah the point about trump is interesting he has again i think said that he's not going to support europe if it goes to war and, and ramped up this rhetoric but again as you said if you look at the last uh presidential term he had I mean, he increased troops in Eastern Europe, NATO troops, I think, if that's, I believe that's true. And, and, mm -hmm. and he, I think he was more saying that European countries should contribute more to the alliance, uh, which is quite different than his campaign rhetoric. So it's an interesting point. But people are um, understandably scared whenever he says, says stuff like, we're going to pull away completely and... Yeah. We don't have much time left. This is probably going to be my last question. I'm sorry it's such a big one, but it's been a pleasure, Mark, uh, to uh, interview you. Thank you very much. Uh, just briefly, how do you see 2024 for Putin? <laughs> um, well, <laughs> yes, I mean, a nice easy one to end off with. Look, I mean, um, <laughs> he is, he's standing for re-election in March and, you know, I'm willing to tip that he's going to win. Yeah, no, I mean, tip, obviously yeah. he, he he's going to win his, his election. Um, but what this does mean, I think the interesting thing is actually that the election will therefore create a certain sort of climate of opinion in the sense of coming up to the election, Putin clearly has to worry about the mood of the population. The thing about Russian elections is they matter not because of the eventual result, which is whatever the Kremlin wants the result to be. They matter because of how much effort does the machine have to put in to, to trying to get enough people out voting and voting the right way that the election looks halfway legitimate. Because the whole point about these elections is really to, to re-legitimize Putin and the regime. So, you know, if it's totally obvious just how far it's been rigged, then actually it'll be counterproductive. So we're going to see a lot of effort in that, which is, all, which is also going to affect the war effort. I mean, this is one of the reasons why, I mean, there are a lot of voices within the Russian military who say we will need another mobilization of reservists. But because that was just so deeply unpopular, I mean, for every soldier they mobilized, two to three Russians fled the country. Um, you know, for that reason, Putin is clearly holding, you know, he's not going to do that until after the elections. I think the thing is, this year will represent, I would suggest, probably the high watermark of, of, of Putin's capacity to, to influence what's going on in Ukraine. This year, um, the Ukrainians, frankly, are... Um, you know, rather damaged by the fact that their counteroffensive last year was not anywhere near as effective as people had hoped. But they lost a lot of men and a lot of kit in the process. You know, the, the Russians have lost more casualties, clearly, but proportionate to population, the Ukrainians have bled more. Um, and so actually, this is likely to be a kind of a, a, a year of building for the Ukrainians as they kind of prepare. And then 2025, maybe they hope for another much more successful major operation. Um, the Russians, likewise, I mean, they're not really going to be in a position, I think, to launch major offensive operations. We will see more activity. They might take back a little bit of territory, take take, take um, a little bit of territory. But essentially, I mean, I think that this coming year is going to be characterized by more of the same. It's actually towards the end of this year that I think we'll start seeing some very, very large chickens coming home to roost. Um, the Russian economy can cover the cost of the war, the fact that about a third of its budget is going on the war effort at the moment. But if one looks at the planning assumptions behind the budget in the Ministry of Finance, they're working on the assumption that in 2025 they'll be able to dramatically reduce defence spending. Ukrainians may have a different take point of view on that. Um, we're seeing overheating within the economy. Um, you know, there's not really any more margin in terms of workforce or investment to further expand the defence sector. They're basically pretty much flat out. Um, seven and a half percent inflation, but actually much higher when you look at, for example, foodstuffs, which is not being matched by wages. Now, again, these are all on the whole lagging indicators. There's less money available for education and for health. Well, it's not like suddenly schools close or hospitals get dirty. 
But bit by bit, people start to notice that things that were meant to be done aren't being done. Um, you know, people have got, you know, had some degree of savings and margins, so they can cope with the higher prices for a bit. But after a while, what we're actually seeing is already household debt beginning to increase to the point where it actually becomes crippling. Um, and likewise, the overall budget, the moment it's fine, GDP increased by 3%, largely thanks to defence spending. But that's artificial because actually what we're seeing is the civilian sector is suffering because all the resources are going to the defence sector. All of these take time to build up. And I think it leaves us in the position of we have a system that is strong but brittle. Um, you know, but there's no reason why, if things continue as they are, the state should not be able to sort of maintain the current war effort and the current control over the population for years. But the point is, stuff happens. There will be black swan events. As we saw, for example, with the, you know, the, the, the Wagner Group mercenary mutiny last year, or maybe it'll be some kind of Ukrainian breakthrough on the front lines, or maybe it'll be some kind of regional economic crisis in Russia that spreads to other regions. You know, there's all kinds of, oh, another Chernobyl-style nuclear accident, who knows? Putin getting very sick. I mean, some people say he's already dead, but I don't believe that. <laughs> the point is, will the system be able to cope with the, with the unexpected crisis? It can cope with the expected day-to-day -day crisis, but not the unexpected, because the three pillars on which it rested was Putin's own authority and legitimacy, the capacity to throw money at any problem because they have big reserves, and Putin's control over the security apparatus. All three of them are declining. Putin himself is increasingly seen as an out-of-touch aging figure. The money clearly isn't there. And as we saw with the Prigozhin mutiny, people didn't join the mutiny, but a lot of the security forces just stood back and said, well, we'll see what happens. So I think for all these reasons, this is why it makes it both exciting and frustrating. You know, it's not like there's a specific point where I say at this time the money runs out or whatever. I just say the system becomes more and more vulnerable to the unexpected. And the unexpected could come next month or in five years' time. I don't know. Thank you very much for the interview, Mark Galeotzi. Suur kiitokset haastattelusta. Thank you very much for joining us. My pleasure, very much. Uh, and thank you to all the listeners and viewers who uh, have watched this so far. Thank you very much. Remember to subscribe. We do have some other English language episodes. If you happen to speak Finnish, you can check out our other episodes. See you next time. Bye-bye.